Hi, I'm Jason Mears, and this is the more detailed version of my previous video, Containers, Kubernetes, and Tanzu Kubernetes Grid. So in this version of the video, we're going to go into a bit more detail, and I'm going to explain uh, some of the steps and some of the uh, blocks that we use in the diagram. So in the um, previous in the previous video, the simple version, we, we had this um, red brick, which was the hardware. And just to spell things out a bit more, what we're saying is that this hardware is the physical hardware or server that our applications run on. So this might be something like a Dell or HP, Lenovo, Cisco server or Supermicro or something along those lines. But it's it's the physical box that this runs on. Uh, next thing we've got on top is the operating system or OS. And the operating system, uh, typically something like Windows, Linux, BSD, or MacOS, is the, is the thing that the application is going to run on top of. Um, before we can uh, run the application, some applications require things called libraries or dependencies. So maybe things like Java or .NET Framework or something like Python. Um, so that's not the actual application itself. It's just a dependency of the application, something it's, it needs to run. And the next thing then is the application itself. And this is going to be the app application or app or service that we're actually trying to deliver to the end user. So this is the thing that we actually want to get to the end user. It just so happens that for most applications, we have to fulfill the dependencies. We have to run the app and the dependencies on, on top of an operating system. And the operating system needs to run on some kind of hardware. So these are what all the different colored blocks are in my diagrams. Next thing we then do is we group them together and we say if we're managing something like an operating system, a dependency and an application as one thing, which is that dotted line around it, that's what we call a virtual machine. Um, and these are the main components. So it's not everything, but this is where the majority of our time and focus is going to go. And again, which shows in black here, you know, this is the friendly name for it. You know, when we when we manage those things together, we tend to call it a VM or a virtual machine. And then up here. Uh, once we've done that diagram, we'll show you the name of the tool most commonly used to, to manage it. So in our case, it's virtual machines and VMs. So we'd use something like vCenter server. And then lastly, where we've got this red text in brackets, uh, what we're doing here is we're giving you any other names or uh, items associated with it that you might have heard before. So, you know, sometimes you hear a word and you don't know what it relates to. I'm just going to give you some uh, things re related to the item we're talking about to give you some context on where they fit in or maybe how they're related. So we'll move straight on to it now. And, and, and what we're going to do here is I'm going to show you how to deliver three applications in, in each of the models we're going to cover. So the first model we're going to cover is uh, is physical hardware. It's actually deploying things on servers. So if you were tasked with um, deploying something on, a, on, a, on three applications on servers, you'd need to buy three servers or three pieces of hardware, which are the three on the bottom here. So for application number one, I'd take server number one and I'd install an operating system on top of that server. I would then install any dependencies that were required on top of that operating system. And then once I've got the dependencies, I'd, de uh, I'd install the app. So I've now got hardware, OS, dependency and app for application number one. And then I'd have to repeat that process on server number two for application number two. So I do same process again for application number two. And then same again for application number three, which is going to run on server number three. So three lots of hardware, three OS, three dependencies, three apps. And what I'm really managing there is hardware, operating system, dependency and app. And we group that together as just being a server, something we, we have to manage uh, most likely manually. Um, and I'm managing three servers to deliver three applications. Next logical step from that is if we were to use one server with a hypervisor. So now I'm able to move from three pieces of hardware to one piece of hardware with a hypervisor on, something like uh, VMware vSphere ESXi. And that allows us to run multiple operating systems on a single piece of hardware. So when I go to install my first operating system for my first app, I install the OS, I add any dependencies, and then add the app itself. So pretty much the same up to here. But now when I go to install app number two, um, an operating system number two, I don't need a new piece of hardware. I can install it on this same one here because I've now got a hypervisor. So I install the operating system, I do dependencies and the app, and that's app number two done. Same again for number three. I install the operating system, dependencies, then the app. So I've now got three applications, uh, three lots of dependencies, three lots of operating system, but it's only running on a single piece of hardware. So it's exactly the same as the other one, except that now I've gone from three servers or three pieces of hardware down to one. 
and now I'm just managing an operating system, dependencies and the app, and that smaller subset of things to manage is called a virtual machine. Um, so that's a virtual machine and we manage virtual machines with something called vCenter server. So we've we've got some efficiency and we've consolidated hardware when we jump from this step to that one. Now the next thing we're going to do is tackle this operating system part of it because we've still got duplication of the operating system. So I've got a, another another server or another piece of hardware and on top of that I'm going to install an operating system with something called a container runtime. Now the most common version of this would be something like Linux with Docker and Docker is a container runtime that allows us to share this um, operating system between multiple containers or multiple applications. So I, we've now consolidated three operating systems into one operating system in a container runtime. So I install my first application by installing dependencies and then the app and that's app number one. I install dependencies for an application for number two and dependencies and application for number three. So I've now got same three applications and dependencies but now I've gone from three operating systems down to one and three lots of hardware down to one. So now I'm only managing the dependency in the app and when we package that up together that that um, logical unit there is called a container and because containers are separated from the operating system and the hardware they're very easy easy to deploy pretty much anywhere and they're very flexible and compatible because all you need is an operating system with a container runtime and you should be able to deploy that container anywhere once we've got it to this state here so in fact it's so easy to deploy containers what you probably find is that people uh, once they start using containers deploy more and more of them because it's so easy uh, and what you can find is you've got lots and lots of containers running on lots of different hosts and, and now you've got this many um, containers uh, you, you might want to have a look at a, a container uh, management and orchestration platform something called Kubernetes so Kubernetes is by far the most popular way of managing multiple containers across multiple hosts the other reason you might have this many containers is let's say we've got here application 1, application 2, application 3 and let's assume that this is all installed in Europe. So we've got our applications deployed in Europe. I might deploy exactly the same application, uh, application 1, application 2, application 3 but I might, might now deploy them in Asia Pacific. So I've now got two copies of each application, one in Europe, one in Asia Pacific and then do it again. For Americas so I've now got another copy of application 1, another copy of application 2, another copy of application 3 and now each of the three applications is running from Europe, Asia Pacific and the Americas so I've got fault tolerance and resilience here and I'm doing things in a more cloud native way so that might be another reason why you've got lots and lots of containers and lots of lots of um, you know deployments and docker images so Again, that's that's just explaining in a bit more detail on the differences between physical servers, virtual machines, and then containers, and the two different tools we would use to manage them. So traditionally, before vSphere 7, we would have a vCenter server uh, running just for virtual machines, and we'd have a Kubernetes uh, cluster or Kubernetes controller running separately just for the sake of containers. Now... Uh, the other thing we said we would talk about here was terminology that we use for them. So sometimes you'll hear people refer to this kind of thing as bare metal because we install the uh, operating system directly onto the server itself or to the bare metal. Next thing we've got here is this uh, one which is a hypervisor. Terms you'll hear uh, around this are things like VMware, vSphere, ESXi. Uh, and then we shift on to containers and you'll hear terms like Docker, Docker images and, and something known as microservices architecture. So in very simple terms, microservices is taking a big application and breaking it up into smaller pieces so it's easier to manage. So you can upgrade individual parts of the application rather than upgrading the whole application in one go and all the issues and problems that that can cause. But um, essentially microservices is, is breaking a big program into lots of smaller pieces or lots of smaller bits of code and it just turns out that Docker and containers are very good for running lots of small pieces of code. So Docker and containers are different than microservices, but they play well together because they complement each other. So microservices break things into smaller pieces. Containers, very good for running lots of small pieces of code. So that's why they fit together. Um, or you'll see them used together, I should say.
the other thing that you'll see on, on kind of this side of the house is something called CI-CD pipelines. And this is something that developers do, which they call continuous integration and continuous deployment. Um, you'll hear things like namespaces, pods and clusters, and that's uh, terminology around Kubernetes. You might hear people also talk about things like infrastructure as code or, or writing infrastructure as code in something called YAML files. So this is a way of deploying applications and services and infrastructure by, by um, typing what you want in a text file rather than clicking through um, a screen or by typing it by hand uh, on a command line. Um, Next things we've also got here is people referring to things called deployments. So when we when we push these things out, we tend to call it a deployment. And there are a few different ways of rolling things out and testing things. And you'll hear things like canary deployments, blue green deployments, or A B deployments. Again, we're not going to go into too much detail on this on this video, but just to say if you hear people talking about deployments or canary or blue green or A B, it's this Kubernetes and container thing. And you'll also hear people talking about Kubernetes and containers in relation to things like like DevOps and DevSecOps, so um, development and operations and development and security and operations. So um, that's where we are with that one. So that's just a breakdown of, of the differences between them. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, show you how VMware build a modern application platform uh, by combining those things. So we, we're not going to do the physical servers, but we are going to combine virtual machines and containers and Kubernetes into a modern application platform, something that we announced with vSphere 7, something that we call the Tanzu family of products. And the other thing I'm going to do, I'm going to have a checklist here because I want to make sure that whenever we do this, when we combine all these things together, it should be possible for everybody to perform all tasks by either clicking through the graphical user interface in vCenter or by typing things through the command line, or by using an, an API, an application programming interface, or by entering what we want into a text file in that YAML format that we discussed before. I also want to make sure that whatever we build here works uh, just as well on-premise as it does in a public cloud, and even more importantly, works just as well across a multi-cloud, so multiple cloud providers or on-premise solutions. So by multi-cloud, it might mean that we, we're not just using one public cloud provider, we might be using Amazon, Google, and Microsoft Azure, and our own data center. So we're going to come back here and make sure that we satisfy all those things afterwards. So when we build this modern application platform, we're going to stick to this, these virtual machines, uh, containers, just as we showed before, but I'm going to introduce something new here and call it a namespace. And this is just a logical grouping of resources that make up the application. So this is a name or, or a, something that we use for uh, grouping together all the resources required to make an application work. And th this is a good thing for the IT industry because we've always focused on virtual machines and containers and the infrastructure. And really the focus should have been about the application itself. And we should have cared less about what makes up the application as we do about delivering uh, the application itself. So the focus has shifted from infrastructure now to applications, and we group all this stuff together in something called a namespace. So what we're going to do here is we've got vSphere with Tanzu Kubernetes Grid at the bottom, which is our container runtime. And you'll notice I'm not going to show any hardware here because it doesn't matter whether it's physical servers in our data center or any of the cloud providers. We just treat it as resources to be consumed. But this is how we get this multi-cloud or multi um uh, on-premise, on public cloud, hybrid cloud, and multi-cloud, because we don't care too much uh, what type of hardware it is underneath. So uh, that's vSphere with Tanzu Kubernetes Grid. And what we're going to do on top is we're going to build a namespace. So we're just going to create a component called the namespace. And I'm going to put everything to do with application number one in that. Now, previously, you would have had an application that revolved around either a virtual machine or either a container or multiple containers. But now we've got the ability to, to have a namespace that contains a virtual machine and one or more containers. So this is a hybrid application because we've got VMs and containers. But vSphere 7 and Tanzu Kubernetes Grid allows us to forget about that and just focus on the fact that what we're delivering is an application. And each application can optionally go in its own namespace. Namespaces are also good for giving permissions as well, which we'll talk about later. So I'm going to, once I've got this platform here to consume, I'm going to create another namespace for application number two. 
and maybe application number two is three virtual machines and only one container. Application number three might be one virtual machine, four containers, and maybe I've got another namespace just for developers to test things. So again, that's that's uh, you know almost like a boundary or a demarcation for running stuff. But it's good in my opinion that we're now focusing more on the application than the infrastructure. So. This is a, a, a platform that consolidates virtual machines and containers and wraps them up in something called the namespace, which logically groups them together, but can also be used for uh, role-based access control uh, and permissions. So once we've got that part, uh, we're going to manage this with uh, vCenter, which now contains the ability to do containers and Kubernetes. So we've got vCenter with Tanzu Kubernetes Grid, and that will do our container management and orchestration. And sometimes you'll see Tanzu Kubernetes Grid shortened as TKG. And what that does for us, that uh, kind of uh, manages and, and works with all this stuff underneath, what that really does is allow us to consolidate all of that infrastructure. So we've got one set of infrastructure now, not multiple copies all over the place, but we consolidate that infrastructure. And we've also got this benefit of consistent operations because we're now managing virtual machines and containers the same way with the same set of tools using things that we're already familiar with. So you'll see here that when we come back to it, you can do all this stuff through vCenter, through the graphical user interface, but we'll also be able to do it from the command line or through an API or through a YAML file. So this is this bit at the bottom. It's consolidated infrastructure with consistent operations. Once we've got that bit sorted out, what we can then do is start applying policies across the board on this. So this is policies that we set that apply to everything under here, whether it's a virtual machine, a container, or the namespace itself. So we can have policies for network, for storage, security, compliance, uh, policies around backup, DR, um, and role-based access control. So as I said before, it used to be that you would have a, um, a vSphere administrator who would have full control of everything, uh, you know, the, the vCenter or, or full control from a management point of view of parts of the vSphere environment, and everybody else who had none. So if you weren't an administrator, you probably had no access whatsoever. Now what we could do with this role-based access control is we could give a programmer or a developer permissions to just one namespace. So maybe they can create machines and delete machines. Maybe they can create a namespace and delete a namespace. And it might even be that we put some limits on that. We might say you can um, build as many virtual machines or delete as many virtual machines as you want in this namespace, as long as you don't use more than this amount of resource, or you can create as many namespaces as you want, as long as you don't consume more than this amount of resource. But it's a, a, it's a finer grain control, and this is part of the way that we give developers self-service, because we say you can't have full control of the whole platform, but we'll give you some control over individual namespaces. So all this policy stuff across here allows the IT department to maintain visibility, control, manage things like cost and governance on, on all this platform underneath. But more importantly, uh, I can't think of a better term for this, but it gives you guardrails and resource limits for developers if required. So we can make sure that everything is in hand and is being looked after, but also allow developers and programmers to actually access the stuff themselves and work with it but ensuring that we've got this as i say visibility control management of cost and governance and all those other things so we've got policies for all of this once we've got those policies in place now we can start giving some stuff to the developers or the programmers and they you know they typically want capabilities like infrastructure as code the ability to create some virtual machines or containers or some infrastructure just by providing a text file with the instructions in it um, the ability to do things like devops or devsecops again other things that developers want to do um, being able to do things like microservices breaking applications into smaller pieces so they're easier to manage um, they might want to do things like manage deployments. So they might want to deploy applications in a more modern way. And then probably most important, they probably need a, a way to consistently manage legacy applications, which are traditionally older applications that have maybe been uh, in, in virtual machines and were designed before containers, hybrid applications, which might be VMs and containers, and cloud native apps, you know, more, more modern ones that are um, so cloud native and more able to be deployed across multiple regions or zones. And again, that sits on top of this. So what that really gives you here is this, the fact that developers still have the speed and agility that they want for developing code, but they've also got the ability to do self-service 
um, so they can request things and get them instantly just as they would do with a cloud provider but on uh, internal infrastructure or on infrastructure running uh, with another cloud provider but it's this it's this consistent way because one of the problems that developers had in the past is that uh, usually cloud providers you know somebody like a, an amazon can give them stuff really quickly whereas their own it department might have said it will take a week or two weeks or a month to deploy it so most developers don't really care where the infrastructure is or what it is they just care how quickly they can get it and they don't want things to affect the speed and ability uh, speed and agility and they like the ability to self-service rather than fill in forms and requests for everything so this is a way if i go you know from the bottom up again this is about getting efficiencies from consolidated infrastructure and consistent operations so we make it easy and cost effective at the bottom we've still got this um governance around here around visibility cost um and you know putting limits on things or or you know sensible guardrails for things and once we've got this in place then the developers can have a bit more free reign on it uh, within the constraints and policy set up here so an example might be we give a developer um, the ability to create something but our storage policy or compliance policy says this um, application or this information must be stored on an encrypted disk or an encrypted volume so we, we force that even if the developer doesn't um, uh, you know go, go through that procedure the policy will either make it happen automatically or alert us to the fact that it hasn't been done it may be that we restrict which networks this application can and can't talk to or which ones the pro the programmer or developer can see um, it may be that the specific policies around how things get backed up or do disaster recovery but what it really means is we've got the sensible controls here so that there's a bit more freedom and flexibility for the flexibility for the developers up there so again that's an overview of how it all fits together and how you can combine um legacy applications hybrid applications and cloud native applications and if we move on to uh, the checklist here we want to be able to do all of this stuff through vCenter and the graphical user interface so most vmware administrators are familiar with vCenter and will probably carry on using that but the developers and programmers could too if they wanted uh, we also want to be able to do it through the command line and through apis which is the way that developers are more used to doing it so that still works um, and developers are likely to use that one um, but there's nothing to stop the VMware administrators using it too although they're probably more familiar with vCenter and the other one is the ability to create infrastructure as code and to be able to deploy things just from a text file and the great thing about being able to deploy things from a text file is it makes it fantastic for reproducing an environment or, re or recovering from an outage or a disaster because if you can build your entire environment just by submitting a text file you can very quickly recreate things that would have taken days weeks or months done by hand uh, and it's very easy to back up a text file as well so you can always have different you can always recreate your environment as it was at a particular point in time if you've got yaml files uh, or something we call infrastructure as code so we've satisfied those bits um, we also need to make sure that this works well on-prem which it does we need to make sure that this works well in public cloud again which it does as i said before we don't care too much whose infrastructure it is under here we just consume it as a resource and it also needs to work with multi-cloud so again um, you, you could have something like this deployed on premise in amazon in google and microsoft azure all at the same time so again it satisfies that point too so that um, that comes to the end of the more detailed version. I'd say it's it's a, it's a bit more of a taster and a bit more detail into how you use all this stuff. There is a much simpler video uh, just on the uh, concepts we talked about before, which was servers, virtual machines, and containers. But thank you very much for your time, and I hope you found that useful.